On December 21st, 2017, President Trump issued an executive order. That executive order is on the screen. It's Executive Order 13818. No, it's December the 20th, 2017. It lists at the very end the there's an appendix to this executive order listing 13 pe 13 people whose property will be if they happen to be within the jurisdiction of the United States will be seized now there's been a lot of rumors floating around the internet that are based upon this particular executive order and the people reach erroneous conclusions and the reason why they reach these erroneous conclusions is because they're unfamiliar with the underlying legal foundation for an executive order, or this particular executive order. Now, executive orders have been around since the days of President George Washington. An executive order is something that's authorized by law, today at least. Executive orders in the past used to be just an order from the president that was within his you know, inherent constitutional authority, like governing the executive branch. A lot of executive orders in the past were done for that very purpose, to tell people that are working for the President of the United States in one of the agencies, do this. You know, I'm charged with the enforcement of this particular law. You know, I want you, I'm going to delegate to you or the responsibility of doing thus and such. That's in essence what a delegation order is. That's in essence what an executive order is. Now, there are limits to executive orders. Let's go back to the time of President Truman. In the early 1950s, there was going to be a steel strike here in this country. The steel workers were getting ready to have a nationwide strike. strike. And that was going to jeopardize, apparently, our war effort then going on in Korea. So President Truman sent his executive orders out to the steel mills, and they took them over. Now, there was no statutory authority for President Truman to do that. He was relying upon his inherent constitutional authority as the President of the United States to seize assets of you know, businesses here in the United States. Well, the, those businesses went to court. And that case ended up in the United States Supreme Court. We call it the Steel Seizure Cases. I think the year it was decided is 1952. And in that case, the Supreme Court came out with this conclusion. You know, the president did not have any statutory authority to do this. So they ruled in favor of the steel companies and instructed the President of the United States to vacate those premises because he had no statutory authority to take over the steel mills. Now, that's just one of many examples of you know, government officials, especially those in the executive branch, where the courts have held that their actions were illegal. So in this context, the steel seizure cases, along with a variety of other cases, you know, are real important when we're taking a look at, you know, what does an executive order accomplish? Now, going back to Executive Order 13818, issued by President Trump on December the 20th, we need to take a look at it to see what kind of authority he cites for doing what he's doing by means of this executive order. But when you take a look at this executive order entered by President Trump on December the 20th of 2017, it, you know, it reads basically like all of the other similar executive orders issued in the past. And he cites as his authority, let's take a look at it, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act and the National Emergencies Act though, and the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act. We're not going to get into that one. And the uh, Immigration and Nationality Act and... Section 301 of Title III of the United States Code. Those are uh, pro forma. They're uh, acts that really don't have, they don't really relate to the purpose of this executive order, although they're mentioned. What we're going to be discussing this afternoon is the basis for this executive order predicated upon the International Economic Powers Act and the National Emergencies Act. Let's kind of go back into time. 
During World War I, October 6 of 1917, Congress passed the Trading with the Enemy Act. Now, what was the purpose of the Trading with the Enemy Act? The, the Trading with the Enemy Act you know, followed a pattern of what a lot of countries have done in the past when they're at war with another country. It just makes all the sense in the world that when one country goes to war with another country, like, for example, the United States went to war several times with Mexico. Well, we're right next door to each other. Well, what you do in a circumstance like that is you seize the assets of the enemy within your jurisdiction. That's been going on for hundreds of years. Now, in October 1917, the President of the United States, pursuant to the Trading with the Enemy Act, started doing exactly that. We were at war with European powers. Pursuant to the Trading with the Enemy Act, the President of the United States would, you know, there were shipping companies, there were all sorts of businesses here in this country. There were companies you know, dealing with patents and trademarks and financial organizations of Germany operating in this country. And so there's a, there's a lot of history behind the implementation of the Trading with the Enemy Act in 1917 where they came along and seized the assets of the enemy that were located within the United States of America. That was the purpose of the Trading with the Enemy Act. It's been in effect ever since. Now, let's, let's take a look at some of the provisions of the Trading with the Enemy Act. It happens to be found at 40 United States Statutes at Large, page 411, the Trading with the Enemy Act. It starts off, it defines enemy. Section 2 defines what an enemy is. And it also goes, goes ahead and, and defines an ally of an enemy. But please notice that citizens were not considered by the Trading with the Enemy Act as being within the scope or the definition of the enemy. Now, see, what, what I've got on the screen is bolded this language. Other than citizens of the United States, wherever resident or wherever doing business. So the plain terms of the Trading with the Enemy Act excluded citizens. It also excluded some other things. It excluded, let me roll down to the, to the right page here. Section 5 of the Trading with the Enemy Act, that's the meat of it, it lists the various things that the President of the United States could do when he's operating pursuant to the Trading with the Enemy Act. Now, what I have on the screen, which is found on page 415 of this act, there's another exclusion here. It says in Section 5B, the President may investigate, regulate, or prohibit under such rules and regulations as he may prescribe by means of licenses or otherwise. Any transaction in foreign exchange, export, or earmarking of gold or silver coin or bullion or currency, transfers of credit in any form. But here's an exclusion. Other than credits relating solely to tra transactions to be executed wholly within the United States. So citizens were excluded from the operation of the Trading with the Enemy Act, as well as those financial transactions that were to be executed wholly within the United States. Now, that theme, once you become familiar with the Trading with the Enemy Act, what you'll find is that later on, you know, that even though the Trading with the Enemy Act isn't really being used much uh, to, to today, what Congress has done is they've come along and implemented new laws that basically seem like to me an extension of the operations of the Trading with the Enemy Act. An example of this is related to banking transactions today. 
when you go into a bank, make a withdrawal or a deposit of cash. $10,000 or more. You know, the bank is supposed to get information, fill out a form, send it to the IRS. That's a currency transaction report. Now, when I sit down and I analyze the CTR laws found in Title 31 of the United States Code, you know, you'll find some very interesting things. We're not going to be getting into the reach and scope of the of the currency transaction reporting laws during this little short clip. Maybe we'll do it on a different occasion. But when you really sit down and you analyze the reach and scope of the CTR laws, to me, they're just, just like what we have here with the Trading with the Enemy Act. The domestic transactions between citizens are not within the scope of the CTR laws just like the domestic transactions of citizens were not within the scope of the Trading with the Enemy Act. Now that we have this foundation of the Trading with the Enemy Act and the CTR laws, let's get, get back around to that executive order, which is the purpose of this little video. When you take a look at that particular executive order, dated December the 20th, 2017, it mentions that it's based upon the International Emergency Powers Act, the National Emergencies Act of, you know, it came out in 19, uh, 1976. So let's go to that one, National Emergencies. During the Depression, after FDR came into office, you know, basically at the start of his administration, we all remember the history of those times. That one of the first things he did when he got into office was close the banks. And after the banks had been closed for a while, they reopened and things were different. Now, after FDR took these dramatic steps of, you know, being the de facto controller of the financial system here in the United States, Congress came along and said, oops, you know, we need to do something about what FDR just did. So they amended parts of the Trading with the Enemy Act, the one that had been enacted in 1917 during the course of the war, which by its terms said it was to cease after the war. But here, you know, after the Congress and FDR come along, well, oh, gee, we got to give the president de facto after the fact authority for what he just did about you know closing all the banks and so they came out with an act that amended that section five of the trading with the enemy act and after that amendment they claimed oh that's the authority for the president of the united states you know he did this before he had that authority but we're now going to ratify what he did with the trading with the enemy act and they amended section five of the trading with the enemy act to permit it to be utilized during an emergency declared by the president. So they thought they had cleaned things up with the Trading with the Enemy Act. Presidents after that started invoking these national emergencies. So in 1973, Congress comes along and starts investigating all these national emergencies that have been declared by presidents of the United States, you know. All of this originating with the actions of FDR. So they passed the National Emergencies Act in 1976. What does that accomplish? Well, when you sit down and read the National Emergencies Act, it talks about terminate to, to the termination of existing declared emergencies. Now, this these laws are found in Title 50, United States Code. And as you can see on the screen, the first section we're dealing with here is Section 1601. It terminates a bunch of declared emergencies. Emergencies claimed to, to have been declared by the presidents, various presidents of the United States. Now, really, when you take a look at this act, you know, like Section 1621, these declarations of national emergency by the president shall be published in the Federal Register. You know, so, you know, now we're, this is a command 
when the president is doing something about some national emergency, you know, the world is going to know about it. Why? Because it's going to appear in the official pub, uh, newspaper of the federal government, which is called the Federal Register. So when you go through this act, this National Emergency Act, in addition to terminating a lot of those national emergencies, as well as acknowledging the, the power of Congress to terminate those national emergencies, really what this act does is it requires the presidents of the United States, when they do so, pursuant to some statutory authority. <laughs> they got to publish it in the Federal Register. So that is all that gets accomplished by the National Emergencies Act that is cited by this executive order that the president issued on December the 20th. Now the meat, the meat of this executive order is really predicated upon the International Emergency Economic uh, Economic Powers Act, which I'm going to put up on the screen. There it is. You will find it in Title 50, United States Code, Section, let's go down to it, 1701. Chapter 35, International Emergency Economic Powers Act. And Section 1702 talks about what the President of the United States can do. When the President of the United States is exercising his statutory power under the International Economic Emergencies Powers Act, when he's doing something about that, it's because there has been an emergency created outside the United States or a substantial part of that emergency has been created outside the United States. So an emergency that happens completely internally within the United States, the President of the United States has no constitutional or statutory authority pursuant to this act to do anything about it. This act only relates to an external and international economic emergency. Now, who causes those types of emergencies? Well, you know, the act itself says it's got to be caused by a foreign country or a national thereof. So, what can be seized? So, if there's a, a let's say that there's an economic, uh, international economic emergency that's been created by China. Well, that's outside the United States. Well, something outside the United States, if it's going to impact the United States in some way, I would think that a president of the United States would be thinking about, well, what can I do about this economic uh, international problem? So he can act pursuant to this law, the International Economic Emergency Powers Act. And if you have a situation created outside the United States or substantially outside the United States by a foreign government or a foreign national, you can do something about it. Or the President of the United States can do something about it. Now, what is he going to do? Well, it typically, just like the Trading with the Enemy Act, you're going to seize, even though there may not be a war going on, you're going to seize the assets of the enemy that might be within your jurisdiction. So what can the president do when he is acting pursuant to the International Economic Emergency Powers Act? He declares for an emergency that's been created entirely or substantially outside the United States, he can designate you know, some targets of this executive order and the assets of that target of the executive order that will be seized. And why is it limited in this fashion? Because the statute says here on page 194 that what can be seized is any interest in foreign property or relative to any property in which any foreign country or any national thereof has an interest. 
So once you understand the reach and scope of this particular law, especially its operative features, you will realize that the language, the statutory language, expressly tells you how it operates. It can be, you can declare, the president can declare an international economic emergency when some circumstance, when some event has happened wholly outside the United States. Or, here, here's circumstance number two, if it substantially originates outside the United States. These two circumstances exclude an economic emergency that happens wholly within the United States or substantially within the United States. Now, once you make that declaration because of this event, what can you do? Well, the president can seize. He can specify. And we'll look at that in a minute in reference to this Trump executive order as well as some other similar executive orders. He can seize the assets of that foreign country that happens to be within the United States, or he can seize the as assets of a national of that country to the extent that that national has assets within the United States. So can you not see that there are <laughs> almost identical operative features between the International Economic Emergencies Act and the Trading with the Enemy Act. Now let's compare Trump's executive order of December the 20th with similar executive orders issued by presidents in the past. Now we all know about 9-11. The Twin Towers went down. The Pentagon was attacked. President Bush was down in Florida talking to some elementary age students. Well, one of the first things he gets back after he travels around the United States on September the 11th. After he gets back to the United States and they begin to plot what's our response to this attack on the Twin Towers in the Pentagon on September the 25th of 2001. President Bush, pursuant to the very statutory authority we've been talking about today, he issues Executive Order 13224 of September the 23rd, 2001. So if you take a look at this, you know, beginning of this particular executive order, the President of the United States is talking about the same statutory authority that gives him the you know, power to issue this executive order. And on the screen, you know, you can see it says the by the authority vested in me as president by the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America, including the International Emergency Powers Act, 50 USC Section 1701, the National Emergency Powers Act, 50 USC Section 1601, and then some sections in the United Nations Participation Act and Section 301 of of Title III of the United States Code, you know, same thing. He goes here and says, I, George Bush, President of the United States of America, find that grave acts of terrorism and threats of terrorism committed by foreign terrorists, including the terrorist attacks in New York, Pennsylvania, and the Pentagon committed on September the 11th, blah, blah, blah. So he lists off, you know, these, these facts. And this is the reason why he is issuing this executive order. You know, he's going to seize the assets of these parties listed in the annex. Guess who is going to be some of the first people on this list? They're on the screen. Al-Qaeda slash the Islamic Army. Abu Sayyaf Group. Armed Islamic Group. You know, going down through here, the Islamic movement of U Uzbekistan, 
uh, the Islamic art, uh, army of Aden, and lo and behold, Usama bin Laden. His name is on the list, along with a bunch of others. And, you know, he didn't, in this one, he didn't, you know, let's see, it takes up, well, it's only one page. It's only one page. But, and he didn't number them. You know, some of the others are numbered. But, you know, this one doesn't have the number. So, but, but now let's move on to another one. Here we have Executive Order 13573 of May 18, 2011. Blocking property of senior officials of the government of Syria. And who was president during that period of time? Barack Hussein Obama. Also known as Barry Soatero. This executive order starts off like the others in the past. By the authority vested in me as president of the United States, Pursuant to the laws of the United States of America, including, he lists only one here, or two here, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, 50 U.S.C. Section 1701, and the National Emergencies Act. And what is he going to do? He, he says here, all property and interest in property that are in the United States that hereafter come within the United States or that are or hereafter come within the possession or control of any United States person, including any overseas branch, of the following persons are blocked and may not be transferred, paid, exported, withdrawn, or otherwise dealt in. The persons listed in the annex to this order. Who are these people? Now, this is a three-page executive order. And the first party, the first individual, a real important term, a legal term, individual. This guy is an individual, and it's Bashar al-Assad, president of the Syrian Arab Republic, born September 11th, 1965. Number two is Farouk al-Shara. He's the vice president of Syria, born in 1938. And then they, you know, list, uh, here we have Barack Obama at least put numbers by the people whose assets were sought to be seized, including the minister of defense and the minister of the interior, and the, minister, the head of the Syrian military intelligence and the director of political security. So now that we have gone over just some examples of some of these. Let's go back to Trump's executive order. Executive order 13818, December 2017. He cites the same authority as the other previous executive orders of President Bush, President Barack Hussein Obama, and now Donald Trump. And he's doing the same thing. And like Obama, here we have, they number the people whose assets are sought to be seized. There happen to be 13 of them in the annex. One is Mukhtar Hamid Shah, date of birth, August 11th, 1939. An alternate date of birth is November the 8th of 1939. And in any event, his nationality is, he's a Pakistani. Then there's Angel Rondon Rio, date of birth, July 16, 1950, nationality, Dominican Republican, Republic. Number three is, three is Dan Gertler, date of birth, December 23, 1973, nationality, he's an Israeli. Alternate nationality is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Number four is Mong Mong So, date of birth, March 1964, nationality, Burma. So you can go down through here and you can see, you know, that these are all foreigners, just like the previous executive orders. Now, as to these 
13 people listed in the annex to this executive order. What's going to happen? All property and interest in property that are in the United States that hereafter come within the United States or that are or hereafter come within the possession or control of any United States person of the following persons listed in the annex are blocked and may not be transferred, paid, exported, or withdrawn or otherwise dealt with. Now, why is this drastic action taking place? Well, the President of the United States, Donald Trump, tells us the cause of this seizure pursuant to the International Economic Emergencies Powers Act. These individuals listed in the, in the annex, he finds that the prevalence and severity of human rights abuse and corruption that have their source in whole or in substantial part outside the United States. That's the language from the law. Such as those committed or directed by persons listed in the annex to this order have reached such scope and gravity that they threaten the stability of international political and economic systems. So there's his reasons why he's issuing these executive, this executive order. He finds these conditions exist. And then he declares that all property of these persons that come within the United States are to be seized just like the purpose of the Trading with the Enemy Act. Now, instead of being limited to just trading with the enemy, we declare for parties outside this country that have absolutely no constitutional rights, If they got property in this country, it's got to be seized.